Let's review what happened, okay. because uh, it's important to know uh, what occurred. So, the scrolls were found in 1947. Now, we don't know if they were found before that. There are some indication that they may have been found earlier than that, that um, the person who supposedly, as the mythology went, the little Bedouin boy or whatever, shepherd, always stereotypes are very favorite, familiar things in these stories. Uh, it turned out not to be a, a little boy or, uh, you know, or someone uh, uh, like that at all. He was a grown man and he was a known treasure hunter and he was always looking for things. Uh, and um, as the story goes, he and another friend of his were tending flocks out in that area. And um, they were looking for lost sheep, as it turned out. Uh, but on the other side of it, maybe they weren't. Uh, you know, he may have just been in his spare time looking for things in, in caves and things. But as the story goes in the most famous presentation of it by the Israeli, by the Israeli scholar Yigal Yadin, who actually was one of the people who was an actor in this drama because his father's name was E. E. Sukenik. And he was the professor of uh, classical studies or archaeology at the Hebrew University. His father and his son succeeded him in the chair. But uh, Yigo Yadin was, uh, had changed his name because if you're going to be in the Israeli service of any kind, civil or government service, you're supposed to have taken a Hebrew name, so he took the name Yadin. Meanwhile, the father was the first Israeli scholar who saw these things. But Yigo Yadin told the story in this book, I forget the name of it, it's a message of the scrolls or something like that. And he's the one who promoted the story of the shepherd boy throwing a rock in a cave after lost sheep, and instead of hearing clatter, 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 he heard kaplunk, 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 and the sound of broken pottery. Almost every book tells this story. So when he climbed in there and he saw broken shards of pottery and some jars actually not broken. The jars, if you've ever seen them when they have their lids on them, look like that, sort of. Something like that. And in there would be rolls of manuscripts like sort of like three or four in a jar or something like that. Parchment manuscripts. But of course the ones he saw were broken because the jars had been broken. They were scattered around the floor of this cave uh, of broken materials. At least this is the story. Now, there's some evidence that the Bedouins had found this before. And this is just the cover story. I don't know what's true or what isn't true on the issue of how or when they were found. So this, uh, these Bedouins got in this cave, and um, that's how scroll studies present this material, by the, the way these things were discovered and the order in which they were discovered. So this is 1947, and that's the first cave discovered. So they call that cave one. And over the next eight years, there were about 480 so on caves or so. And so there's plenty of caves, but they numbered them according to if they were manuscript bearing. So there were supposedly 11 manuscript bearing caves in all over that eight year period discovered. Uh, the mother load was cave four. The fourth manuscript bearing cave discovered. But the, the, the manuscripts in cave four were not as well preserved. And by the way, all this is in the Bajan Lee book, the Dead Sea Scroll Deception. Anyway, they go into all this stuff pretty carefully, so um, you can get it. And you, so you should get that book, I think, as a background book. It's just the 
best one I know for background. So the first cave is uh, where the first scrolls were found, 47, and they were ultimately there was the big mother of was cave four. K4 was not found until 1952 or so. And uh, cave 11 is the last cave found. And that was found around 1966. Well, what happened was, when these Bedouin treasure hunters or others found these materials, they brought them up to Bethlehem, which is the closest town up on the plain to the scrolls area. And I can draw you a little map here. So here's the Dead Sea, right? And this is where Qumran would be. And Jerusalem would be up here on the spine, and Bethlehem would be here. So Bethlehem is the closest area to uh, where the scrolls are. There's a wadi here. Uh, dried up river bed that's had water some of the time. So this Pet Benham boys went up here to Bethlehem, gave the scroll that they found to a merchant there by the name, who's well known by the name of Candid. Then he was a member of a Syrian Christian group of some kind. So he went to Jerusalem with the text to a Syriac priest of some kind in the Armenian quarter of Jerusalem with the manuscripts, and that fellow's name was Athanasius. His name was Mar Athanasius, which is the name for, I don't know if that's how you spell it, but something like that. And he claims that he had a vision, he's written a book about this, he, he claims he had a vision when he was young that he was going to see manuscripts. And so when this guy came with the manuscripts, he claims he knew we, and could read them and knew what they were. Whether or not he did or he couldn't, he wanted to buy some. So he made an appointment with these guys to come back the next week with what they found. He said he originally immediately recognized that they were valuable and authentic things. They came back the next week, but for some reason the, go, the gatekeeper or uh, you know doorman outside the, the building of monastery wouldn't let them in. Whether something got mixed up or the signals got crossed. So they were had these manuscripts, they didn't know what to do with them, they started peddling them on the street. So they went over to the Jewish side, because this was on the Arab side, and they went to the Hebrew University and found this Sukenic, Yadin's father, who immediately took the took some from them to inspect them. And then he realized that they were authentic. And he, I think, bought some from them. Meantime, Martha Nassius made another appointment with these fellows, and then he bought some more from them. These all came from Cave One. Then they were taken to the American school where Cross and others were on the spot, and this guy from Claremont, who did the ancient manuscript center, who took the pictures that everyone knows about, the early picture called John Trevor. So anyone associated with these texts got to be famous or, or, or um, well positioned afterwards. Cross, you know, and Trevor and these people were at the Albright Institute called the Americans. At that time, all the countries who were doing business in the Ottoman Empire and afterwards in the Middle East had a school where their, uh, who was responsible for their, their scholars and archaeologists and people who were working in the area. So there was a French school, there was a British school, there was a American school, there was a German school. These are all in Jerusalem still. Now the French school was, the French were always the traditional defenders of the Vatican since Charlemagne's time. And then the Crusades as well became also the, the, the arm of Vatican archaeology too. There was a French Vatican dual school called the Ecole Biblique, but it was run by French priests. And they had a task, they were tasked in the late 19th century by the church to make, because a lot of new discoveries were being made and it was to some extent upsetting the, uh, the parishioners or the flock. And their job was to make the results of modern archaeology comprehensible and palatable and acceptable, if you like, to the rank and file. So they had a theological um, warrant. I think to discuss it pretty well, I think. They, they explained 
how they got started and so on. So they, they were not just a, um, a player that had no uh, agenda. They had an agenda. Their agenda was to put these things within the realm of church doctrine in an acceptable manner to the modern discoveries that wouldn't upset or undermine or upset the, you know, the rank and file. And that's what they did with the scrolls. Now, whether they did it on purpose or they really believed this or whatever, that's the big question. I think they really believed this because of the reasons I showed you in Millie's book. And they couldn't see these documents as I see them, and I may be wrong, but I think I'm close to the truth, as a quote, Christian. But they're not Christian because they're not Christian, just like Millie says. So they don't have an idea of the Christ. But my point is there was no Christ in Palestine at this time in the first century that came through the letters of Paul later. And uh, it's Paul that basically is uh, promoting the Christ doctrine, if you want to call it that, the supernatural being who's called the Christ. Uh, whether the original people in Palestine knew anything about a supernatural being called the Christ is something else. I don't know what it is. But in my view, you see, the Essenes are really what Christians were in Palestine before they got colonized. So whether there was a figure that uh, they saw as the Messiah, which is not the same as the Christ, <coughs> because the Jewish Messiah is not necessarily a supernatural being, or never was supposed to be, particularly. But as Paul amalgamated this material with Greek mystery religion, Hellenistic uh, ideas of gods and expectations and Roman religious presentations of the emperor, then the Messiah became a uh, son of God equal to the emperor. But as you see in Palestine, you see there's no idea of a son of God as such. You do have with the scrolls uh, a sonship ideology. We even have a son of God text, but as you'll see, it's a symbolic son never a copulation with a human woman and like the Greek gods did. The problem is that I think the Essenes were to some extent what quote Christians were in Palestine. That's the and that the Christ ideology that becomes defined by the word Christian is a later is a later ideology. So what are we going to call these people? You see we it's hard to speak about Christians in Palestine because there was no Christianity yet in Palestine, therefore there's no Christ as such in this world. There is a Messiah, there are Messiah ideologies and things. So that's the problem, and uh, you know, uh, Millick put his finger on it, but he couldn't go further than, than where, he, where he went. In any event, these people realized the importance of these documents, and so Sukhenik University bought some, and Mar Athanasius bought some. After the Israeli Arab War of 48, he left Palestine because things were in such an unsettled state. And he ended up in a Syriac church in Hoboken, New Jersey. And uh, he brought a metal trunk with him with the scrolls that he had bought. And his church in Hoboken, Frank Sinatra's home, yeah. home ran into some economic difficulties, so he pulled these scrolls out from under his bed one day and advertised them in the Wall Street Journal in the early 1950s, scrolls for sale. And the Israeli uh, representative in New York happened to be the son of this Sukhenic fellow, Yadid, who was now the Israel consul or representative in New York. He saw the thing and he got third parties to buy the rest of these scrolls from Cape One. So the Israeli government, over about five or ten year period, got a hold of all the scrolls from Cave One. And they went into this museum of the book. And that's what people thought the Dead Sea Scrolls were. But the Israelis didn't try to make political capital out of them. They just put them in the museum, let everyone see them, and published them, and didn't try to make huge academic reputations. They just opened them up for everybody to see. And people thought that's all the Dead Sea Scrolls were. But they didn't know that there were 10 other caves. So what happened was, after the partition of Palestine with the peace accords in 48-49, the 
The scroll area, Qumran fell under the Jordanian, originally the Palestinian, but then <laughs> the Jordanian government took over the Palestinian area, and you never saw any Palestinians complaining about that until the Israelis came. Then suddenly they wanted a Palestine state. And um, then the Jordanians set up this commission called the International Team. They said they didn't really care about the scroll. They were Hebrew, and as some people said, they gave some evidence that the Jews may have had some right to be there, actually, and that they didn't really want to get involved in that either. So since the church people were very interested in them, they gave it all over to Father DeVoe, who used his diplomatic and uh, high-level connections, the position he was in to become the head of the international team. And he chose all of the people who were on it. This all developed in the 50s, early 50s, after the partition of Palestine. So DeVoe became, even though he wasn't trained as an archaeologist, he was trained as a sociologist, Beijing gave his whole background. He started organizing archaeological expeditions to the Dead Sea in the early 50s. In the, I think he had three or four seasons out there. And he started mapping the area. So it took them four years even to get out to where the scrolls were found. And um, so in his mapping, he uh, people at that time didn't do the work themselves. He had money, so he paid Bedouin to do it. And you see the pictures of all the French archaeologists priests are out there in little tents drinking their coffee or tea or whatever and really doing very little else and paying all these uh, Arab people to go and do all this stuff with them. Well, somehow DeVoe missed Cave 4 in his surveys. That were his Arab team's quote, Miss Cave 4 in his surveys. And it was one of my students who pointed out to me, because he did the, one of the ones that went out on the, on the expeditions with me, his name was Dennis Walker. He called my attention to the fact that six months after DeVoe missed this cave four, the Bedouins so-called discovered it and cleaned it all out. And I don't really believe that he could have um, that he could have missed it, or at least the Bedouins didn't tell him about it. One, one or the two, because it's with it's within eye shot of where the excavations on the Qumran plateau are. I mean, in your book, I don't know if you can see it. So I don't know what the true story of the discovery of Cave 4 is. That's where people have suspicions that uh, things happen that may not have been totally. Here's Cave 4 here. It's, it's, it, it, it's on the wadi here. And you see, you can see the openings in it from, this is taken from where the ruins are here. And you just look across this, uh, this uh, little uh, ravine, and there, there's Cave 4. So you mean to say no one walked down into there while he was doing years of excavations there? I mean, that's just almost impossible to imagine. Of course, if you never went out from your tent and your tea ceremony, maybe you could. Maybe that could happen. Well, I don't know the whole story, but the point is, six months after he missed it, the Bedouins found it all. Now, whether they found it, I'm sure they had already found it, but they weren't either telling him or they didn't want to know. But then DeVoe did another funny thing. Since he was controlling everything, he paid people, they claimed to stop a black market, to bring up the material to Jerusalem uh, that they had found, pilfered from caves, by the square centimeter. So that's how they paid them. They had a set price to avoid black market, they claimed. Whether that was true or not, the point was that the Bedouins worked in teams and they had to pay off all their people. So if they found a big manuscript, they'd just rip them up and give each person and I think that accounted for uh, some of the, not all of it, but some degree of the destruction of the materials in Cave 4, the fact that it was all ripped up in little pieces. Now, some of it may have been little pieces, a lot of it probably was, but a lot of it was probably divided up <coughs> in work parties because of the Ecole de Bleak policy of paying by the square centimeter. And, and it all may be innocent. In fact, it probably was, but as I tried to say at the beginning, it's all totally mindless stupidity. Well, in any case, he went out there and did some excavations, and he became known for the uh, archaeologists of Qumran, and he's written a book called The Archaeology of Qumran, or The Dead Sea Scrolls and Archaeology of Qumran. Well. Um, cave 2, they found in their surveys, there was not much in there. But a third cave, Cave 3, was where this famous uh, thing, that was two rolled pieces of copper called the Copper Scroll was found just sitting on top of the ground in this cave three. They did find that. And uh, for a long time they refused to uh, open it. 
Then some clever American scholar read through the Indian, it says something that had been, like we said in the Maccabee books, banged out on copper. Read through the back of it, could say what it was, and it was a treasure. You can see it was a treasure. So they cut it open in Manchester, that's where Allegro worked. John Allegro, who became famous with some of his books on the Dead Sea Scrolls. He was the heretic among them. He had been sent from England to be part of the international team. And uh, he described in his book his frustration because the Vaughan Millick would not let him mention the Copper Scroll and what was in it in his work that he published called the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1956, I think. Because Millick hadn't published it yet. And that's where all this monopoly stuff got started. And, and then the, he said some things on English radio and TV, occasionally covered his that upset uh, DeVoe about relations to Christian origins. So they tried to get him off the team. In the meantime, he was trying to undermine them with his relations with the Jordanian monarch. And he said he could have had it all out with the Jordanian king in uh, 1965 or so if he hadn't been thrown off the team and if the Israelis hadn't come. The Israelis came in 67, or I don't remember what the date he said he could have had it all out. But the point was, they didn't know all this infighting, and, and they didn't want trouble with the Roman Catholic authorities or the Vatican either. So they, um, they um, left everything in control of the um, team that Father DeBeau and the Jordanian government had put there in the first place and didn't interfere with the setup. So the thing remained unpublished for another 20, 20 years, all the documents that they had. So all of what we're talking about, the unpublished Dead Sea Scrolls are from Cave 4 and some other things from some of the other caves, not very much. And there's a massive stuff that was unpublished, and that's what we broke the monopoly with in 1989 here, because I got the pictures of all those things and we published them all. Uh, through, unfortunately, the Biblical Archaeology Society in Herschel Shanks, I told you the story of, of that. But the point was that um, from the time they stopped John Allegro from talking about the Copper Scroll until we broke the monopoly, there was a curtain of silence pulled down on this material. And that's what made people suspicious. A friend of mine from Germany who actually did the work for, for them on many of the manuscripts, he was a German scholar who they invited along, not just Millig. He said, after there was a famous uh, book written in, in the New Yorker magazine by this left-wing American intellectual um, called uh, Wilson, what was his first name? I can't remember his first name. Anyway, he'd written about Lenin and Trotsky, Finland Station, and he was a known fellow traveler of the you know, left-wing parties back in the 20s and 30s. Edmund Wilson, his name was. And he wrote this, he got most of the scrolls, and he wrote this thing for the New Yorker magazine in 1955 where he suggested the scrolls had a lot to do with Christian origins. And that frightened the people at the Ecole and in the international team so much that according to this German scholar who was with them, they said, let's go slow until the crazies go away. That, he, he quoted that to me. And um, basically a curtain of silence, a go slow process, uh, developed because of the fear of people saying things about Christianity that may or may not have been true in the eyes of the people who controlled these texts. And so this, this went on for 30 more years. Uh, and what happened was scholars lived and died and didn't get it all out and passed their manuscripts on to the next person and then um, you could make an instant scholarly superstar just by giving them an unpublished manuscript and letting them publish it. And, uh, you know, uh, the monopolies just continued. And I wrote all about that in the Dead Sea Scrolls Uncovered, how control of the unpublished manuscripts meant control of the field. Harvard had control of a certain amount of text because of Cross's position. Mostly biblical texts, not sectarian texts, which are the interesting ones. Millick and DeVoe kept all the sectarian texts, meaning all the new texts no one had ever seen before, under their strict control, and only gave it out to people they considered trustworthy. That is, people have the same view of the scrolls that they had. So I said in my work that control of the unpublished manuscripts meant control of the field. Meaning if you give a young scholar, if you want to study scrolls in America, you'd have to go to Harvard. Now, I didn't go to Harvard, so I was free of their ideological orientation. But that they didn't know that I was a scroll scholar. If you wanted a good position as a, 
I came to Cal State from nowhere, Bill, basically, in their view. Uh, they've never heard of this place, and we're just religious studies. We're not scroll department or something like that. If you want to be a scroll scholar, you'd have to be, go to their program, and, get, and then they would decide if you'd get a job somewhere. They would recommend you. So if one of their students like was given this uh, text called the this mystical text called the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice, and her name was, uh, I forget, uh, Carol Dibson. And then uh, she published this, she became an instant uh, superstar in the field because they gave her a text. And she went to Emory University, got this uh, very fine job there, and that's the way the field went. Then they would control the journals, they would control the reviews of all books. If you didn't tow their line, your, your books would be criticized or you would be called a crazy or a lunatic that I've been called many times by these people, and uh, so on and so forth. So this is how they controlled the field. And it was like a curia almost, an ideological curia, but it was in an academic secular world. So to me, to my mind, breaking, and they really resented our, my, and uh, most of my, but a lot of people's efforts together, breaking the monopoly. They really went after us. So if you've heard bad, bad things about me, it's because I wrote the monopoly, and they wanted to come after me. And that's where the lawsuits developed in Israel, too. So why Israel? Oh, because the Israelis, because of the big fuss over the scrolls, realized suddenly the scrolls were important. They hadn't bothered about the scrolls for 20 years and left them in the control of these other people. Then they saw all, all the world fuss that was made about the scrolls because of the agitation and movement that we began. And they realized, oh, they were just getting in on it. So they put one of their own editors in, in charge of it when this individual, Strobel, was found to be a drunkard and an anti-Semite. And they removed him from the head of the thing and put one of their scars. And just at that time, we opened the whole thing up and published all of the scrolls. So they were really furious because they wanted to make their academic reputations out of the scrolls. They did anyway, but they still couldn't, couldn't to stomach the fact that we had to undercut them as far as they could see it by publishing all these materials. So all these people had their axes to grind, and they did come after you. So if you've ever seen my name taken in vain anywhere or anything like that, you'll understand why. Uh, maybe it's legitimate, but you've seen the kind of work we've done in this class, and you can judge if I know anything about what I'm talking about. Last time, we were talking about history, if you like, of Dead Sea Scroll studies, and uh, the different things that were involved in the original um, finds and so on. There were monopolies going on and things, and uh, I felt that uh, one could do anything to break these monopolies. One could also get a freer interpretation of what the scrolls were about. And I had gone um, one day to the Antiquities Authority, and I was trying to be friends with the people there. So I was telling the guys there who were responsible for appointing, since I had to win to get my own permits, you know, why are you appointing these people head of the editorial committee when they have this kind of mindset? And uh, all I got was a blank look from these people. Israelis tend to be very uh, sluggish, and uh, it's hard to uh, communicate anything uh, original from your end that they're going to pay attention to. I don't know what you would call that characteristic. So anyway, um, when the opportunity came to me to be able to get a hold of the pictures, I didn't hesitate to get them and also to make arrangements to get them published. But when the committee heard that I had the pictures because some people, I wouldn't say uh, betrayed us, Brill, the publishing company in Holland, was who Professor Robinson and Claremont and I had both published with, had agreed to publish them, but then they got frightened at a conference because they saw a lot of emotion and so they consulted the Israelis and the other scholars who were the establishment scholars. And so by doing that, they showed that we had the pictures. So there was such emotion involved that Brill canceled the publication with Robinson and me and 10 days or two weeks before the scheduled publication and then proceeded to make a contract with the official committee who of course by that time was ready to make a contract because they knew the pictures were out, but they hadn't been willing to do it before. So we were thrown in the hands, that's all told in the Bajidly uh, Hidden Scrolls, we were thrown into the hands of Herschel Schenk's of the Biblical Archaeology Review, 
who I've told you something about because we were desperate to get the pictures out. And at that point, the the um, the uh, Huntington Library got wind of it, and they discovered they didn't know that they had a set of photographs there too. Since they all knew that we were running to try to get this done, they figured they'd beat us all to it. I was their consultant to some extent. They came and asked me what I thought because they knew I'd had this trouble with the publication. When I heard of what they were going to do, uh, my heart sank because uh, you know I knew all this trouble that we had had. And this was in April that we had our publication was supposed to come out, and you know they didn't open their things until September. They got all the credit for everything, but they already knew that we had. In any case, I knew what that all meant, that they were going to become superstars and we were going to become nobodies, which is fair enough. I mean. And they asked me what I thought. I said, you know, you should go ahead and do it. I'm not making myself a hero. But they said, well, who will we have trouble with? I said, oh, well, you won't have trouble with the committee because they don't come out of hiding. They don't make public things. They do everything behind the, the scenes. The Israelis will make trouble for you. And that's exactly what happened. Israelis threatened them and everything like this. And they never did let anyone in to see their pictures till long after, you know, the Israelis published everything themselves. And the Israelis then organized an exhibit to go across the country of all the pictures, all because of what we did. They wouldn't have done anything, nothing. You know, there were exhibits at the Metropolitan Museum, at the San Francisco Museum. Chicago, they took them all around the country, they made a catalog and everything. All of that was because of what we did here. But they weren't going to do anything. So anyway, that's the hidden story of the scrolls if you're interested. And the involvement of Cal State Long Beach if you're interested, which is a rare thing. I never got any honor from this university from, <laughs> from, from it either. Uh, you know, all I did was get, you know, griping and, uh, you know, uh, moaning about this, that, or something else. But um, I was kind of lucky because of uh, the opportunity presented to me to get a hold of the pictures. Uh, that, that was really, And because of my problems with the editor of the scrolls, I didn't hesitate to do something with the pictures. So I wanted to uh, break the monopoly. We did. When we... Um, this other scholar who was a good friend of mine, who I actually respect, a person called Philip Davies from Sheffield University, was, everyone was frozen out except the members of the committee for 30, 40 years, much better scholars than myself, never saw the scrolls, the unpublished scrolls, that is. Uh, he and I went to see the uh, head of the Shrine of the Book at the time, <coughs> the same period that I'm speaking about, and, after we spoke to him and we spoke about the publication of the scrolls, he said, you won't see the scrolls in your lifetime. The publication, that is. Because the Israelis had given everything over. And he knew that. He was one of the people who gave them the authority. And as we went down the steps of the ministry or the office building that he was housed in, uh, you know, the comment I made, or we made to each other, you won't see it in your lifetime, it's the hell you say. We'll see the scrolls before that. And um, it wasn't, it was less than five years later that we had all the scrolls out. So a little determined effort, and a little bit of agitation and things, you can do a, a lot of this work. Uh, but you may not get credit, you may be presented as a maniac or something like that. So uh, there's 11 scroll caves found between 1947, theoretically, and 1966. I told you one of the people, Dennis Walker, who was in, when I finally was going to go back to Israel with more expeditions, who represented me, because I was still not going out there because I was still worried about the Israeli authorities. They wanted to know where I got the pictures from. And they wanted to know who I, uh, who had given me the pictures because they wanted to prosecute these. And I knew they would maybe try to cause trouble, maybe they wouldn't. Uh, I don't know why they were so predictive about it. In any event, because um, everyone benefited, they benefited, the scroll committee benefited, all the research benefited, everyone got interested in the scrolls. 
sort of like the Shroud of Turin or the Da Vinci Code, you know, for a time the scrolls were like everybody's, uh, uh, you know, curiosity was aroused. Certainly. So everyone got publications and exposure and television programs and all kinds of stuff. So no, no one had any complaints through really. um, So Dennis Walker went back and, um, you know, he was one of the students who had worked for me in these classes earlier. He first came in the early expeditions with me. Uh, but uh, he, he um, pointed out to me, because he did some work on the uh, surveys that Father DeBoe did, and the person I told you who was in charge of everything under the Jordanians was this Father <coughs> DeBoe, who was the head of the Dominican Order, and the Ecobit League, I explained that to you last time, and uh, he was in Jerusalem in the east side, and you couldn't really go between Jerusalem and East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem. It was a no man's land in between, you know, uh, barbed wire, and uh, only the UN went back and forth. You know, it was a ceasefire levels. So the Echo was on the east side, and so they uh, were left in control of things. And Father DeBeau was the person who was the head of the Ecole, head of the Dominican Order in Palestine, on very high Vatican committee, head of the French school. The Bajan Lee people, whether it's true or not, say that he had been in the, in the 30s, before the war, in a group called Action Francaise, which was supposed to have been, if not a fascist organization, a French right-wing organization, but it uh, verged on fascism. So uh, there's a lot of uh, not very palatable things involved in this sort of thing. Deveau was a member of the um, as of an order and everything, but I knew his cook pretty well because he'd gone out on expeditions and he told me all about Father Beau's mistress. Uh, I'm not saying that. This, and I can trust this guy who told me this with my life. He's a very straight uh, Arab fellow. Is the cook at the Albright Institute, the American School. He's since passed away. His name was Omar. He was a pretty good fellow. In any event, um, the the situation was that they were on the spot, and that was the point I made. That control of the hunt of the manuscripts meant control of the field. They brought in who they wanted. But they wouldn't let anyone edit the scrolls, write about the scrolls, get good reviews, publish anything, be head of journals who didn't. Uh, uh, agree with their uh, theory, and their theory was that these were Essenes, but these were peaceful Essenes. Uh, and <laughs> you can't read these documents and think that these people are, are, are peaceful. So someone else uh, uh, developed a theory in the early days of Dead Sea Scroll research in the 50s and 60s called the Zealot Theory, saying that these were really Zealots, and uh, in a way they were right in terms of what the material looked like, but they were they were hounded. They were hounded. I have footnotes about them in that that scrolls in the first Christians. Uh, two scholars in England at Oxford called uh, the name of Cecil Law and I think it's uh, G. R. Driver. <coughs> and, and, and he wrote a book, you know, on the zealots and the scrolls, and uh, he wrote another book called the Judean Scrolls. So um, if you didn't, you know, if, if we could break the monopoly and publish some of the scrolls and get a different view, then it could break open the, the discussion a bit more. And Cave 4 is where most of the unpublished materials came from. And actually, Cave 1 has perhaps some of the most important materials. Because in Cave 1, the materials are in a very good state of preservation. You know, they were in scroll jars mostly, and when they weren't, the scroll jars had been broken probably more recently. So we still use the principal documents from K1 today. In our, and what I'm doing here, I don't do much of the fragments. Uh, the community rule, that was in the uh, K1. The war scroll, the war of the sons of light against the sons of darkness, that was in K1. Habakkuk commentary, that was in K1. The hymns or psalms, whatever you want to call it, that was in Cave 1. Two Isaiah scrolls were in Cave 1. Um, and some other sort of things. The only thing that wasn't there that we, was very important is the Damascus stuff. 
The Damascus document was not in cave one. Fragments of it were in cave four. But it had been found previously in Cairo, in a uh, Jewish synagogue in Cairo, uh, which is uh, a place of uh, a depository of old texts. Synagogues back in the Middle Ages and before had a repository where they threw old things, particularly if they had the name of God on them, because they felt you had to bury those things. You couldn't destroy the name of God. You know, superstitious or whatever you want to call it. But so they always had a Geniza, a depository for old prayer books and manuscripts. Well, this Geniza turned, was found by, um, when the British took over Cairo in the 1880s and 90s, after the Suez Canal uh, affair, when the British got a hold of the whole area after the French sold of the Suez Canal in the 1860s and 70s. This discovery was made in this Jewish synagogue that had been actually apparently previous, I don't know if it still was, a Karite synagogue. The Karaites are a group of Jews, not very many left, who are against Orthodox Judaism. Uh, they um, considered sectarian Jews, uh, but they mainly don't like the rabbinic approach to things. And though they now have their own rabbis, <laughs> but they don't like the rabbinic approach. They particularly don't approve of the rabbinic literature, the Talmud, and all that material. It's a little bit like Islam has conflicts like this in Islam, different legal schools, schools that don't accept the hadith of the of the prophet, stuff like that. Hadith are sayings about the prophet. These Karaites, they're old documents of theirs that do remark that scrolls were found in the 800s, that strange documents came into the Jerusalem area in the 800s. And a Christian, uh, another Christian prelate of some kind, uh, I forget his name, but it's in all the books, uh, wrote a letter to someone talking about the sudden strange appearance of documents from caves. And Jerome, the Christian scholar, mentioned such things too, earlier than that, in the form. So in this Geniza were two versions of the Damascus document. The fellow who found the uh, document in Cairo was a fellow named Solomon Schechter, who was a, a reader in rabbinics at Cambridge University. And he then came to America, this is 1897 or so. I think it was found in 1896. And he became the founder of what in America is called conservative Judaism became the head of conservative Judaism. This, this one discovery, the Geniza, made him so famous that he could leave Cambridge and come to America and become the founder or the head of conservative Judaism that didn't even exist before. And, and he was became the head of that just on the basis of these finds, particularly the Damascus find. Everyone knew at the time it was very important to find. And lo and behold, it had never been seen before, but in the Dead Sea Scrolls, fragments turned up. Now that's what upset me and a lot of us. Professor Davies wrote the letters originally that we tried to break the monopoly like that before I got the pictures. Because someone else had shown me the computer list of what existed in the Israel Museum that had previously been the Rockefeller Museum in Jordan. But when they united the area in 67, the Israel Museum took it over and they had all the records and someone showed me the computer printout of all the fragments that people like me weren't supposed to see. And I saw how many fragments of the Damascus document they actually had but weren't published. And I said, this was in 1986, 87. When um, I was there in this Albright fellowship. So a lot of good came of that just from incidental encounters with people. And uh, he, you know, I knew what there was. And so I knew I could ask for certain things. So I asked, I wrote the Israeli Department of Antiquities and asked to see the unpublished fragments of the Damascus document. And I put there, because a lawyer in Israel had said, you know, if you are unjustly denied something by the government ministries, you can go to the High Court of Justice in Israel 
and uh, make a case that you've been un, 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 you know, unduly denied something. But the lawyer said, you need a paper trail of refusals. We asked to see the unpublished fragments of the Damascus document, and we had the actual photograph numbers because I'd written them down from this computer printout. I knew exactly what the numbers were. Why did we want to see them? Because we wanted to see if the Cairo version agreed with the Dead Sea Scrolls version. That was really important to know how accurate the Cairo version is a, is a medieval copy of some documents. They had parallels in the scrolls, but they weren't publishing them. Because they hadn't given them out to scholars and there was a lot of, you know, they were going as slow as they could. So that was a legitimate concern. They weren't interested. Who knows why they weren't interested? I mean, it's very interesting to know, is the Cairo document accurate? As it turns out, it's very accurate. And there's more than it has. In fact, there are other materials, and as I showed you those materials that were the last columns of something, they're the last columns of the Damascus document. So there was additional material that wasn't in the Cairo versions that were found in the Guinea. So that was really important material. And of course, they turned us down. And that's when we started all this campaign to free the scroll. But never mind. The point was that the Damascus document was very important, and it wasn't found in K-1. So these things got to Cairo. This is a repository in Cairo from 11, 1200 period. But scrolls first appeared in the Jerusalem scene, we know from contemporary testimony, in 7, 800. And Karaism, this form of Judaism, actually refers to things in the scrolls. They saw scroll documents. And that's what reinforced their uh, antagonism to rabbinic Pharisee Judaism, the scrolls. And they, it's quite clear from their literature that they had seen material. There's some interesting, well, not a lot of books in English on the subject, but there's some interesting books on the subject about the cards. And that's why some scholars in America when the scrolls were found, didn't couldn't believe they were ancient documents. They thought they were Karite documents. And for a long time, they wouldn't be convinced until carbon testing, which is not such a reliable tool, I don't think, anyway, but you know, it was good enough to get a rough general date, anyway. And um, so the people who thought these were Karite documents had a reason for thinking that, because the Karites had been talking about similar things. Karite talked about the sons of Zadok, which is a very big part of the Damascus document, the sons of Zadok. As we will see. So we're going to read the Damascus document first, because the Damascus document is really the most important, in my view. That, well, there are several important documents. But the community rule, the Damascus document, and the habit of country, which is why I translated all those three in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the First Christian give you a, a, a translation which is really, I think, accurate, not fake. And I gave you the Hebrew so that if you don't think I'm accurate, you can check me. <laughs> Go look in a dictionary and see if I'm accurate. Uh, there's people who, who, who translate things, but they don't give you the Hebrew, so you can't tell if they're, if they're cutting corners or playing a little bit of a preconceived um, spin game with you give you something that they do for you. Works. Works righteousness is an extremely important idea in early Christian thinking, usually associated with James. Paul is supposed to be the person who talks about salvation by faith. He's not interested in so much in works. He's interested in grace. I learned all this from studying the scroll. But the letter of James, which people, Mark Luther thought shouldn't even be in the New Testament, he got very angry that it was there. So this is not a Christian book. It isn't. It, it's a Jewish book still. But it's like the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there it says, it attacks the grace doctrine, doctrine and the faith doctrine. And it says, oh, you foolish man, don't you know that Abraham was also justified by works or made righteous by works? So it's the righteousness of works. And he said that's how we're saved. Faith and works working together. 
okay, I'm not talking Christian theology so much here, but you know, that's conceived of, and I think it is an attack on the Pauline position of faith. If you're only saved by faith, then you can have people that get deathbed uh, conversions like Constantine. Uh, well, uh, not in Palestine, that wouldn't go. Uh, in uh, overseas Christianity, yes, but not Palestine, no. Works, and works were generally considered to be of the Torah, of the law, of the Mosaic law, which is why Paul is so intent on attacking the Mosaic law in Galatians. Because it's so important in the Paul-James dispute, even in Christianity as we know, we know the faith versus works argument in Christianity. The only thing missing there is that works just as any good works, not necessarily works of the Torah. Okay, the scrolls over and over and over again use the term works. But very crafty translators who don't want you to see the connections with early Christianity then translate it as deeds or acts. And so you and they're not even consistent in their translation. And you don't catch the, the, the charged meaning of the word works. That's what I mean about how important the translation is. For instance, instead of saying Holy Spirit, I suppose the person who translated Spirit of Holiness. Oh, then you call upon it and you know it doesn't hit you. It doesn't hit you that it's Holy Spirit. This is not the Holy Spirit. This is just the Spirit of Holiness. That's not the same thing. Oh, yes, it is. This is the games. These are the tricks. This is why the scrolls are misinterpreted by the general public and have been for a long time. Why it was necessary, for me anyway, to give a translation that I thought was accurate and also to give the Hebrew so you could check and see if it was accurate. All these things are done all the time, even in the Bible. Singulars are made into plurals, even in the translation of the letter of um, James. I think it says at one point they killed the righteous one, he offered them no resistance. And you see the translation says, and they killed the righteous ones, they offered them no resistance. They take it from singular to plural because they don't want you to know that they're talking about Jesus being called the righteous one. And that it isn't the Jews that killed them according to the letter of James, it's the rich. The editors so often have an agenda. The scroll fellow I told you about, it's over the Vermesh, his translation. Sometimes he'll put Messiah's plural when it's clearly the verbs and everything are singular. Because he doesn't want that there's a singular conception of the Messiah. He feels obliged to make you feel that this is different from Christianity. So, you know, and I show the words, like it says, and the Messiah of Aaron and Israel, it says at one point, uh, stood up. And that can also mean be resurrected. So they say the Messiah is plural. Yes, but the verb is singular. So, you see, these people who are loath to allow you to think like that, just shift the translation somewhat so you don't think like that. So I always give you comments about those things in my translation. I put little parentheses and I explain, uh, you know, why such, such and such is being done. And I think that's important to do. You say, why do you translate all the scrolls? Uh, I can hardly get my books written, you know. Uh, I did the most important ones. I'd like to do a few more. I'd like to do the war scroll, though it's not necessary to do. The translations are not quite adequate, but more or less adequate. Uh, hymns, Thanksgiving hymns, are important to do. Uh, but uh, there are not a lot of other complete documents that have to be done. The other fragments are are okay. So what we're doing in this class then is uh, is uh, mostly the stuff that was found in Cave One, and then the fragments of of the Damascus document were found in Cave Four. But since we now know that the fragments match the, the Cairo version, we can use the Cairo version. But I wanted to say that what else was found in the scrolls? What I'm talking about at the moment are sectarian documents, documents peculiar to this group, 
uh, or we also call them extra biblical documents, documents not found in our Bible. <coughs> Those were the most interesting things that were found. And of course, aside from cave one, the lion's share was found in cave four, missed by the Deveau survey people, and therefore ended up in complete fragments. Whether it was as fragmentary as that in the beginning, I can't say. It certainly ended up that way. Uh, probably it was pretty fragmentary, but maybe not as much as it ended up. Was that just an, an innocent mistake? I guess Bates and Lee would think not, but probably it was. Um, the Copper Scroll was found in Cave 3, which is the official interpretation of it that Allegro claims he was not able to publish his material. He wrote his Dead Sea Scrolls in 1956 because DeVoe and Millick and these other people refused to let him speak about it till, the, till, till Millick, DeVoe's assistant, had published it. And so he was totally frustrated by this. And uh, their interpretation of the Copper Scroll, oh, it was dropped by a passerby. It wasn't part of the scrolls originally. Because why would the scrolls be interested in a treasure map? Because the scrolls are otherworldly, like us. They're, this is a monastery. That's why they used to, like Frank Cross at Harvard wrote a book, The Ancient Monastery at Qumran. What, well, maybe a proto-monastery in the sense that it probably started the monastic movement in Christianity as we know it, movements of this kind, but, you know, it wasn't a kind of monastery, it was more like the Templars. You know, the, the crusading order, if, uh, but I don't think they were learning war necessarily there, but they were as aggressive in their mind as the Templars. Uh, Islam has a lot of the ethos of the scrolls, unfortunately. Although I think the scrolls are more interested in righteousness than Islam is. Islam has mixed scroll aggression with Pauline faith. So they actually call Islam the faith of Abraham. They even speak in a Pauline manner in Islam. You know, they speak about, um, I forget how they speak about the faith, but they talk about the faith all the time. And, um, they don't speak about the work so much, though they, they are interested in such things, but they don't emphasize it. They're Pauline in their theology, but they're Dead Sea Scrolls in their ethos. So it's a very odd mixture. Finally, let's go back. So sectarian, non-biblical things are really interesting. It turned out I think there were some 400 some odd works never seen before. Works never seen before. So, uh, some in multiple copies, many in multiple copies. And uh, when all was said and done, um, and um, the rest were biblical manuscripts in multiple copies, many multiple copies. They were very interested in the Bible, but the Bible hadn't been put in its final form yet because. There was no book as such, they were just different scrolls, they were just thrown in helter skelter. So it wasn't in the form that we know it. Though I think they understood what the Torah was already. That the first five books of Moses, as we call them, the Torah, they speak about, and I think they're familiar with. And the prophets, some of the prophets, they're already recognized as being pretty holy. But the other books, the, the lesser books, probably hadn't books come into final, you know, what was canonical and what wasn't. So it turns out every book of the Bible was there except Esther. I tell you in the Maccabee Sacrifice Christians book why I think Esther wasn't there. The reason is that I think Esther had the wrong ethos. It didn't agree with the ethos of this scroll. This group is uncompromising. It would never agree that a Jewish woman should marry a foreign king and do all that flirting and whatever it takes to make him change his mind in a sexual way. Uh, that wouldn't be a book that they would have approved. Of. And therefore, a Purim that the rabbinic Jews celebrate is not a, would not be a festival that they would that they would regularly.
Uh, so every book is found, and a lot of uh, books that we know from other sources like Enoch, Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, books that are not in our Bible, but anyway, a lot of books that we are know about, which we now call Apocrypha, were found at Kumar, but not all. So every book except Esther was found, many in multiple copies. And that's basically what's found. There are no New Testament writings, and I don't think there would be. And even though someone found a few Greek fragments there, which could have been left by a monk who was doing some work in one of the caves later on, even those, I don't think they are anything to do with the New Testament. No one knows what those Greek fragments are that are there in one of the, in, and I forget where they, which cave they were found in, but um, seven. Um, because the ethos is so different. I mean, the Gospel of Mark and so on, the ethos is like 180 degrees opposite. And all you just have to do is read the scrolls to realize that, the same as Esther, you wouldn't have had a Gospel of Mark there either. And I, I say, how do you know? You, well, you'll see when we're done how one can know that. Because the scrolls, and that's, I think, what's wrong with another theory, that these are just a, uh, an eclectic means uh, no real order or anything. Norman Gold at, Har uh, at Chicago, one of the people frozen out of, the, out of this. Yeah, this theory, the, the, I was in that uh, interpreting history show this summer too, which I was on. I don't know why they had Gold on there, because Gold's theories are really very, very boring and childish and not very deep and superficial. This is a collection of manuscripts from, from the Jerusalem uh, uh, area that were put in the scrolls as a kind of Geniza is what his idea is. Just a helper-skelter mix. Well, well, that's totally, uh, uh, that's, that's completely unsupportable because anyone who reads the scrolls knows that the same characters are mentioned from scroll to scroll to scroll to scroll. The same ideas, there may be different authors, but the same ideas, the, the ideas of the sectarian texts are totally homogeneous. You'll never find a compromising one. You'll never find one that applies the messianic prophecy to Vespasian. <laughs> you, you'll never find any document of that kind. You know, it's, they're all totally uncompromising, uh, all works oriented, and very aggressive, extremely militant. And uh, so they're not just an eclectic collection, they're the literature of a movement. the Damascus document. We might pick up some of these other things as we go along, but I think we should get into the documents themselves if we can. So um, I'm going to use my own translation. You can use um, Ramesh if you want. Um, it's in this book here. The one he's got. And there's a pamphlet. It's page, uh, well, in Vermesh, what page is it in Vermesh? 125. 125, and then uh, this one is 355. And now here, all you knowers of righteousness. <laughs> the thing Vermesh has, all you, here I have an older version of Vermesh here, so it's easier to handle. I'll just pick this up and I'll compare occasionally what he has with what I have it's sometimes interesting. He says, all you who know righteousness. Uh, it's about the same thing. But in fact, you see, it does really, literally say knowers of righteousness. That's what the Hebrew really, really does say. All you who know righteousness is fair enough, but uh, <laughs> you're all knowers of righteousness. So right away, even though this is not the beginning, in fact, we found now earlier from from we now know from, and he's got some of the other versions from K4 that he shows you there because of the breaking of the monopoly, they now have all this available to them that they didn't have previously. This is the Cairo Geniza version that I have here. We now know that there are some material preceding this as an introduction. Not, I don't think, terribly significant, but um, I think at one point it does refer to zeal in the material proceeding. Here we right away know 
that righteousness is an important doctrine. And that is, if you look at the Hebrew, I give you the Hebrew. It says, Vata uh, Shamu Kol Yodei Zedek. Kol, it means all, Yodei means knowers of, Zedek is righteousness. So it actually uses the word Zedek there. So, you know, it always should use the same word. The word should be totally consistent in translation. And many times in these translations, it is not. Garcia Martinez in the Abril paperback is not consistent because his translation goes through Spanish into English. And I don't even know if the Spanish was terribly consistent or accurate. So it can't possibly be consistent, and it isn't. The other translation that's available on the market is Weiss with some other associates. And that's not very good either, I don't think, in terms of being precise. And here I've tried to always the same word in English. And there it is, right away, and comprehend the works of God. Because he has a dispute with all flesh. And it literally says, will do. And the reason I put the do in there is because I want to emphasize the word doing, because that's there. That's in the text. And the word in Hebrew for works is based on the word, verb in Hebrew to do. So doing is important. And if you, you have to do the Torah, who, and he will do judgment. What do you have there in Ramesh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it literally says, oh, say, mishpat, do judgment. That's why I didn't put condemn, because if there, are, there is a place where condemn is used, but it's, it's not here. Um, do judgment may be condemned. But do judgment is more than condemn. It, it implies a last judgment, which is an important concept. It's supposed to be the last judgment in the scroll. That's why you say the translations are not important. They're very, very important. Yeah, you can look at that here. What page is it? Uh, that's for Mesh. I think he is, uh, regardless of my criticism, I think he is the most precise of all the translators when it comes down to it compared to the other full ones. I mean, he's closer than any of the other ones that you might encounter. Though, as I said, there are a few things that are a problem. And all those who, and so this is addressed to the knowers of righteousness who worry about the works of God. And it is against the ones who insult or blaspheme God. And they rebelled when they forsook him. And therefore God hid his face from them. Already we're beginning to see this is a very pro-Torah book. Because it isn't just going to be rebelling on anything, it's going to be backsliding from the, the law that the rebelling comes in. So it's a totally opposite of Paul in almost every sense. No allegorical exegesis. That is no symbolic interpretation of passages. And here's a very important concept. He hid his face from Israel and from his temple. Does the book care about the temple? Yes, it's temple oriented. And delivered them up to the sword. I put it in italics, but I think it's an important concept I want to pay particular attention to. Do judgment, I think, is important. Delivering up to the sword, I think, is important. Particularly because in the New Testament, he uses the word delivering up quite frequently. But actually, it always is relates to Judas Iscariot. They didn't, that, that, if you look at the Greek in the New Testament, it doesn't literally say who betrayed him. It says who delivered him up in the Greek. The reason I'm interested is to show the parallels in the, in the Christian New Testament documents with the Dead Sea Scroll usages even though they're being used differently in a different context, I, I do believe, and that's my, my theory, and not theory, that's not my, what I've come to observe and feel, that 
authors, some of the authors, Paul, for instance, uh, documents in the New Testament, no concepts in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which they are revising, reframing, recasting, deliberately perhaps changing, if you want to be the most uh, unsympathetic in terms of how you put it. So that's where I'm going to watch where it says delivered them up. Usually it's delivered them up to the sword. But because of his memory of the covenant of the first, it says Rishonim the first. What does Burmesh have there? Forefathers. Forefathers, that's right. The first are the forefathers. But the reason I put the first in there, because it literally says the first, because of the New Testament, and the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. To show that these concepts are here, but they have a different connotation. And it may not come through, so yes, this literally does mean the forefathers, but it doesn't say forefathers. It doesn't say, you know, Av in Hebrew, Avot. It doesn't say father or fathers. It says the first. So, you know, when I'm a translator later, even though, you know, maybe you want to make a beautiful translation, I might put in parentheses or a footnote, you know, literally this is the first, or I might put the first, and I might then say this means the forefathers or the ancestors. But also, it's important to put the first. Why? Because of the first covenant as opposed to the new covenant. He left a remnant. Now this can be, you know, a kind of grace here. You know, Paul and Christianity, as we know it, through Paul's view of Christianity, I don't know if Jesus taught grace. I never saw him mention the words in any speech, and I'm not sure what he taught as I think I've made clear to you. But we know what Paul taught because we have his letters. And he speaks about grace and so on. This is uh, a kind of grace, and we'll see it through here quite often. It's not for your sake that he's doing this. It's not because you've necessarily even done good works. It's not because of your righteousness even perhaps, although that would be good if you were righteous. It's because of his memory of the first. It's a kind of grace up towards the first that he's going to that he's going to save you. In spite of the way you are. So though it doesn't actually, I don't think there is a word for grace in Hebrew, you see. But even though there is no word for grace as such, it is a kind of grace concept, and we'll see it later in this document too. But it's always connected to the affection for the first. He's going to save you out of love for the first. And this is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know, Moses, so on and so forth. The forefathers, if you like. What does he do? He left a remnant. That's a concept from Ezekiel, if you know the prophet Ezekiel, which he says a remnant will survive, you know, this is at the time of the destruction. And I did review the whole history of the Israelite Jewish people at the beginning of the class with you folks, as you recall, at the time of the destruction of the first temple, which was around the time of the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, 590, 585. And it's going to be mentioned here, Nebuchadnezzar, you see, in a moment. So Ezekiel was writing around that time, and he says, you know, well, I cut my hair, part of my hair, I burn, part, you know, some will be burned, some will be this, and but a remnant shall survive. Anyway, these people are aware of documents like that, and they honor them. And did not deliver them up. Again, repeated a second or even a third time. We'll see the word will be used around six or seven times in this book. Which is why I, I tell us To be destroyed. So we know delivering up has to do with the sword, destroyed. You see, Judas Iscariot delivered up Jesus according to the New Testament presentation. For him to be destroyed, if you will. That's the implication. So we call that betrayed. That's not what the Greek says. And in the era of wrath, 
Well, the era of wrath is first mentioned, if you recall, and we did read that book in this class, in Daniel. It's difficult to follow the chronology of Daniel, but the wrath is in Daniel. That's there. Um, now, here's a problem in all scroll studies. 390 years after he delivered them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of, Pal uh, king of Babylon. Now, that's an historical personage. He's named outright. The documents are willing to name, as I think I've said in my work, people in the past who are not a problem for them. They're only to start a mysterious code vis-a-vis -vis present day people that they could get into some difficulty talking about. The way I do in this class all sometimes. Anyway, he visited them. 390 years is important because if you feel that this is accurate dating, and that's what I think threw a lot of people off. Then we know when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple around 585 or 586 BC. So from 390 years after that, you get down to about 200 or 180 or 90 BC. So then, of course, the simple-minded people, the people who take this in its overt sense, I mean, they say, "Oh, that's when we're talking about." It. Uh, but they don't realize these people did not have an accurate knowledge of chronology. They really didn't know exactly how many years there were between Nebuchadnezzar and the present. So this is either to be taken as accurate or it's just an attempt to estimate within the, within the Daniel framework of 490. 70, uh, 7 times 70 or something like that. Or, I think, if you've read Ezekiel, they're actually referring to, Ezekiel says in the same time about his prophecy and that he, the, he hears about the destruction of the temple. And then he says that his tongue clung to the roof of his mouth and he couldn't speak after he got the word of the destruction of the temple. He was among the refugees, he says, at the uh, river Habar in Iraq. And he says his tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth for 390 days. Meaning it didn't literally stick. He couldn't prophesy for 390 days. And then the word of God came to him and he was able to you know, speak again, you know, as a visionary, prophetical person. I think that's what the 390 years refers to. 300, because it's already mentioned, it's already, you know, alluded to Ezekiel. And it's a 390, not days, but the number 390, I think, is taken from that. The, the period of time that prophecy was dead in Israel. I don't think that they know exactly. Anyway, the number was useful. But this is a very important argument in Dead Sea Scroll Studies. What does the 390 years mean? And are they accurate in their, in their chronology? I can only point to uh, Josephus' uh, priest list at the end of the antiquities, he, he is totally off, his chronology is totally off, and he's someone who's very smart and lives at this time, and the Talmud, the chronology is totally off. <clears throat> so uh, that these people should have an accurate chronology and everyone else should not, to my mind, is uh, it's not convincing. They got the 390 years from some other symbolic calculation, but that's something to consider. He visited them. He visited them. A visitation. And he caused a root of planting to grow from Israel and Aaron. Now that is a singular root. And then we have allusion to Israel and Aaron. And that's a messianic allusion. Because um, planting imagery is very important in... Um, Messianic imagery in the various psalms, and and of course the root is really a, a word that is used to refer to the Messiah. Actually, let me see if I can find the actual Hebrew here of the root here. But what line is that? What seven? He visited them and Yismak, yeah, Zemak, the Zemak David, the 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 branch of David is a very famous and it's in the scrolls too. Messianic idea. And here, 
This is the verb based on the Zemach, the, the causing to grow, but in fact it's making a branch grow from Israel and Aaron and a root and so on of planting to inherit the earth. Okay. Yeah. There may be a reference there in 168 to God visiting Mary or something. The point is that this is like the New Testament presentation of Jesus in, in a way. The Christian presentation is that God visits Mary through the Holy Spirit or whatever, and a child is conceived. Now the point I have a parenthesis that the usage is singular here. Even though it's a double um, reference to Israel and from Aaron. The verbs are all singular. Everything is singular. He calls a root to plant to grow from and to inherit his land and to all that. Is None of those usages are plural usages. Now, I'm not saying that's parallel to the New Testament totally, but there is a kind of um, parallelness there. Now, this may be a whole community and not a, a necessarily a given individual. Later on, it will be a, a, an individual in this talk. The Messiah of Aaron and Israel will be spoken. Um, this may be a community based on two, uh, you know, priestly and Israelite and so on, to uh, engender something using messianic imagery of the roots of planting. Uh, if you, there is some stuff in, um, in Matthew, I think it's Matthew, when they're talking about blind guides. Every plant that my father has not planted shall be uprooted. Using the planting, the rooting, and other vocabulary that one has here. But this is all about a Heavenly Father planting a plant and a root of planting. And that, that, those two are operating in the same vocabulary structure, whatever you want to say. And one is against the other. Because it's called, talking about the blind guides, the Pharisee, they will fall into the pit. And then it also, it's also talking about cleaning, not having to clean your hands before you eat. That's what that passage is talking about and that you shouldn't listen to the Pharisees who want you to wash your hands before you eat, and that he said these things in the parallel thing in Mark, but Mark doesn't have the thing about the plant being uprooted, but in Mark it says declaring all foods clean, whereas here we do have the restrictions on dietary regulations. <laughs> to inherit the land and prosper on the good things of his earth. And they understood their sinfulness and knew that they were sinners or guilty men. Well, that's one way of putting it in Hebrew. I know another way of putting it. And they confess their sins, or if you prefer, in the New Testament language. And John taught remission of sins in the wilderness. Depending on how you translate this, and they understood their sinfulness, and they knew that they were sinners, or they knew they were guilty men. But, you know, it can be, you know, Hebrew is a very imprecise language. But in any case, there's an idea of atonement for sin here. So we're not going to get a messianic idea. See, these are things that are not appreciated about how incredible this document is. Okay, and they were like blind men. Oh, there's the blind man. Oh, I didn't ever saw that before. And, and they were like blind men who fell into a pit. And the blind leading the blind. See, every time I do the scrolls, I learn something new. I didn't even see that. I saw the pit, and I saw the falling into the pit, but I never saw they were like blind. And groping for the way. The way, Acts tells us, was a name for early Christianity in Palestine. Acts tells us at one point, I've got a footnote about it here, Acts tells us at one point that Felix knew a lot about the way. And it means, by the way, uh, early Christianity in Palestine. It uses it about three different times, actually. You can look it up in the Concordance. But even more than that, John came in the way in the wilderness. Anyway, in Hebrew here and in the passage about the way in the wilderness, it's the same word, Derek, the way. And um, way, the way terminology is very strong. 
in all the documents of the scrolls. So you see, we're getting parallel after parallel after parallel with the New Testament, even though the, 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 the connotation and meaning is different. We just did one page here. And uh, the, what people couldn't see, I think, originally, is that the vocabulary was so alien and the ideas so different that they couldn't see the relationship. And, but uh, there's nothing in the second century BC that looks anything like this. That we, that's why we read the Maccabee books. That's why we read all that material because uh, we, want, uh, we want to know what the second century BC looked like. And the first time we hear stuff like this is in the New Testament, although it's different in the New Testament, I admit. But now we're seeing more and more vocabulary, and we'll see, we'll see so much vocabulary that's the same in the Old Testament, you know. But it's different connotation because it's works righteousness against Pauline faith ideology. Anyway, they grow for the way for 20 years. So th now that's a precise thing. They were lost for 20 years. They didn't have a leader. So something happened. Maybe the Messiah was killed. Something happened in between God visiting them and then 20 years. This is all very uh, esoteric. But something is going on here. And God, listen to that considered their works because they sought him with a whole heart. God considered their works. Are you keeping that consistent translation of works and heart? Uh, let's see, let's see. And, and, ah, and God observed their deeds, says Vermesh. Well, you can't change it because if God considered the all you who know righteousness and consider the works of God, you can't suddenly change it to deeds because it's the same word in Hebrew in both instances. I mean, it's ma'asim. It has to, it's based on the root doing. So, you know, doing. You want to use deeds, go. But works is the theological thing we're familiar with. And if you don't use works, then you're not being square with the public who knows about works. That's what I'm trying to say. And God considered their works because they sought him for their whole honor because their works were righteous you see and they had also confessed their sins remission of sins they raised up for them a teacher of righteousness we've heard that at the beginning this is addressed to who the knowers of righteousness those people who care about righteousness to guide them the blind guides again in the New Testament to guide them in the way of his heart. And that's what I mean about being consistent. In the Habakkuk commentary on this and all of them, we're going to hear that the righteous teacher knows the way of God's heart. And God put the knowledge into his heart, the, te the teacher of righteousness is heart, or the righteous teacher, or whichever you prefer. It's more a setting. Moray's teacher, Tzedek, is righteousness. To guide them in the way of his heart, and he made known, uh, this is why we want to use the first, to the last generations, what he would do in the last generation. So we're in the last times. <laughs> so important to the New Testament. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, just reading this, it's hard to put this in the second century BC, which is where the, um, the consensus scholars have wanted to put it on the basis of paleography. Nothing else. I say that paleography is an imprecise science at best, and it's internal data where there's a question that has to take precedence over external data such as so called paleological, paleographical sequences. I criticize all that in the Maccabees Zadokite book. And he made known to the last generation what he would do in the last generation to the congregation. Now that is a da can be, act literally means assembly. And of course assembly in Christianity means church. The assembly or church or congregation of traitors. Now this is traitors. And what do the traitors do? They weren't just people of a different party. They turned aside from the way. They were turners aside from the way. Now we know that the way is by now. The way in the wilderness. 
we're going to find out it's the way of perfection. What do you have in the Vermeshna? To the who departed from the way. Who departed from the way. Yeah, but the actual in Hebrew again is literally a noun. Turner is aside, depart from is. It's not a verb. It was a noun. The people who turn aside, the, the turners aside. Anyway, I'm just trying to be precise. Either one is good, but the literal Hebrew is turner aside from. This is the time it is written, like a straying heifer did Israel go <coughs> astray. And it's a quote from Hosea the prophet. Now another individual is finally introduced, a man of scoffing. It's usually called the scoffer. The ideological adversary whose ideas are just a joke. But it literally says man of scoffing. It's two words, ish halatzom. Anyway. He arose, and he's an opponent, right? And he's an ideological opponent. He's not a political opponent, necessarily, because what he does is an ideological thing. He's part of the, the, the congregation of traitors, traitors to the way in the wilderness. They were originally part of the way of the wilderness, but they turned aside and deserted the way of the wilderness. What did he do? He pours over Israel the waters of wine. Later on, we're going to get a guy called the spouter of wine. But you have to understand, the word spouter in Hebrew is the same root as the word pouring out is in the verb. Hebrew is built up on three-letter roots. One is matif hakazav, and this is hitif. Hitif is the verb, matif is the noun. So really, it's not really the spouter, it's the pourer out of wine. He's called the matif hakazav. Because I was lying, the poor out of lying elsewhere. So this is the same person. This scoffer is the same person as is elsewhere called in the scrolls, and that's the consistency of these documents, the liar, the man of lying, the poor out of lying, the spout of lying. And so what then that there's a, also an idea of waters <coughs> could even imply baptismal waters. In any case, he's poured out lying waters over Israel. And he's the ideological adversary of the righteous teacher. What does he do? He brings low the everlasting heights. He abolished the pathways of righteousness. He removed the boundary markers, and here we're back again, which the first, the forefathers, had marked out for their inheritance. And it's for this reason that God, or he, called down upon them the curses of his covenant and delivered them up to the avenging sword of vengeance of the covenant. The boundary markers that the first laid out are the law. That's what the Mosaic Law, and what he did was remove the boundary markers of the Mosaic Law, which tells you what righteousness is. And it's for this reason that God became angry, because this is what the first, the ancestors, the first generations had marked out for their inheritance. And therefore, he delivered us up at this time to the sword, the avenging sword of the covenant. What's your question? Is this figure a historical I will say constructive uh, I think he I think he's a historian. He oh. goes through lots of uh, lots of documents. Oh. Well that's my theory, but it doesn't mean that I'm right. I've tried to claim you that yeah, in my book I think it's a Paul. It's a Paul like person, whether it's Paul or not will depend on the chronology. That would make James the righteous teacher and Paul the <laughs> Paul the ideological art. Yeah, but he these people are there, and uh, you know, James is the tzaddik in early Christianity, the righteous one. In fact, they use it in place of his own name, and since you're asking, I'm not saying that is Paul, but I mean, the point of the matter is, it's a Paul-like teacher, in the sense that he teaches straying from the law, he deserted the new covenant, he went astray and led others astray. And what he did is he, 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 he led them astray in a trackless waste. Where is that? Um, caused them to wander astray, line 15, in a trackless waste with no way, no, no way, no, no derrick, no way in the wilderness, no John the Baptist-like way. 
We're going to get the way in the community rule with baptism and everything else. We're also going to get the way in the wilderness twice spoken of in the community rule. Well, you can't have things like the way in the wilderness twice mentioned in the community rule with the same ideology as here and then tell me we're in the second century BC. This is what I mean on ideological grounds, you're in a first century environment. Because we didn't see anything like this in the Maccabee books and Josephus or anything else. The only place you see this kind of material is in the New Testament, but from an opposite ideological perspective, from the perspective of removing the boundaries. I'm just saying, this is the native Palestinian. So when people say, oh, Eisenman said these are Christian documents. No, I'm not saying that at all. Because Christianity is what Paul preached and what was accepted because Paul is the first person, I think, who spoke about Christ in written form. And Luke in Acts tells us Christians were first called Christians at Antioch in Syria in a Pauline community. But I say it's proto-Christianity. It's what Christianity was in Palestine before it went overseas, it, before it got colonized. For they sought smooth things and chose illusions. Now, the seekers after smooth things is another common expression that goes across all the documents, which is why I say these are consistent documents. This is not just any old collection. This is a collection of documents of the <coughs> And the smooth things uh, in Hebrew is halakot. And if you know these Semitic languages, they like to play on words. So halakot actually plays on another Hebrew that rabbinic Judaism is very interested in. Halachot. This is legal traditions that you find in the town. And that's what Phariseeism did. So halachot. The name for the law, the Talmud, and the Mosaic law together is the halachot. So most of us think this is a, 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 an aspersion against the Pharisees and the halachot that they sought. But Paul calls himself a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He says he learned at the feet of Pharisees. So he's not to be uh, separated from whoever is being criticized here. The Pharisees are definitely being criticized, I think. I mean, what's wrong with the Pharisees? They seek smooth things and shows illusions. So watch out for breaks or loopholes, an expression from Isaiah 30. And they chose the fair neck. And I say that that means they chose the easy way. In other words, they chose the fairest of the flock. They, they chose the easy way. They didn't do the hard way. You know, they didn't follow purity regulations and so on and so forth. They justified the wicked and condemned the righteous. Now that's where you really should use the word condemn, because it really is the opposite of justify. And later on, in column four, we're going to hear that the sons of Zadok, they do it right. They justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And they transgressed the broke covenant, broke the law, we finish up. They banded together against the soul of the righteous one. And against all the walkers in perfection, that's what this group calls itself here and in other documents, and they pursued them with the sword and attempted to divide the people on the wrath of God. Anyway, it goes on like that. This is a history of a certain period. These people call themselves lots of things. Among those things is walker in perfection, or perfection of the way. They are the perfect ones. Now, I can uh, pick this 